All right. Well, I'm excited because, yay, it's happy time now. We're getting to happy time. And we get to start chapter 24, the yes. last chapter in the book of Luke. Yes. Oh, by the way, I know some of you have been um, asking, what are we going to do? We're almost done with Luke. What are you going to do? Um, so I just wanted to let you know, we uh, and please pray for us on this, but we are praying about that, truly praying, like, God, how do you want us to proceed here? And... Um, what do you want us to study and how often do you want us to do not what how often can I do it? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> without dying. <laughs> We're not gonna be doing it every night. Uh, because I just can't it. do it. I, I'm like crossing the finish line like a marathon runner and almost throwing up, but she feeling spends really like good. Five hours a day prepping for this. Twelve. <laughs> a day. She's working all day, so anyway, prepping I don't want this. to be about me. Just wanted you to know we are not going to stop but it will morph a little It'll bit be a little different yeah morph a little bit okay enough of that but welcome get into it welcome to bible study hub yes, we're welcome. starting in luke chapter 24 today thank you and we have just been going over um jesus death and yesterday we talked about his burial and how um nicodemus and how joseph of arimathea really fulfilled a prophecy and also gave Jesus a, um, a burial fit for a king. And so now we get into some really crazy, exciting stuff. It is crazy, exciting. This is exciting. like the climax. I think what we ought to do, Noelle, is <clears throat> let's go ahead and le read verses 1 to 12. It's kind of a big section, but I, I kind of want to get that in our minds. Then we're going to go back to the top and we're going to break it into like one or two verses at a time and just sort of break it down. I love it. All right, let me start reading Luke chapter 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. Bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Mm. All right. Well, it says in verse 1 that this was the first day of the week. So we know... That this is Sunday. They actually didn't have like words like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They would just say the first day of the week, the second day of the week, the third. That's how they delineated their days of the week. So we know that that would have been Sunday because it was the day after the Passover. And I also just wanted to say, how do we know that Jesus was buried prior to sundown on um, on Friday? And and I, I just wanted to make sure that we. We have clear understanding. Before we ask that question, mm -hmm. can yeah. we just share with them briefly why it matters that he was buried before sundown on Friday? Yeah, go ahead. Um, sundown on Friday is the start of the Sabbath or Shabbat, and after that they cannot work and cannot touch a dead person. They would be defiled. Mm -hmm. And so all burial preparation of Jesus has to be done prior to that, or whoever was doing it after would have been breaking the law. And that couldn't happen. Exactly. So we know that the women had prepared, it says prepared the spices. This is Friday, right as Jesus is being crucified. Like he's, he's just passed away. He's just given up his spirit, I should say. Um, that they, they have the spices or they're going to go buy the spices or prepare. But they don't have time to put them on the body. We talked about that. So we know that he died on Friday because they were able to get the spices ready to go. But there was no time. Remember, they're not allowed to do anything on the Sabbath. And in their world, 
they still don't even know the delineation between what is God's law about the Sabbath and what is the religious leaders laws about the Sabbath because it's all interwoven for them. So they can't pull any, like they wouldn't say, well, you know, I'm not really working. This is something that I need to do. Yeah. <laughs> not allowed. So it didn't even cross their minds that they would do that. But that's all in the providence of God because it just helps us know absolutely he was in the ground, in the burial tomb for three days because if you haven't been with us, any part of a day in that society, in that culture was considered a day. So he went in the ground Friday, he was in the ground Saturday, and he came out of the ground Sunday morning. Um, now, I also just want to talk about this. What an incredible act of love. These women getting up early, early Sunday morning, and as soon as they were permitted, as soon as Sabbath is over, it's over by about sunrise-ish. As soon as it's over, they're like, let's go. We got to get to the tomb. So my question to you is, why do you think they were in such a hurry to get to the tomb with those spices? And why was that such an incredible act of love on their part to do it? So go ahead and, and think about that and comment. And I want to hear what you have to say, because I think this is something that really gets quite overlooked. None of the mm -hmm. gospel writers really talk about this, but I think we can infer from culture. And if you're a woman, we kind of understand just our feelings as women, our emotions, how they play in. <laughs> so I'm interested to see what you have to say. Why did they do that? Okay. Daddy says those spot spices must have been very costly. No doubt. That's a very good... That's excellent. I hadn't even thought about that one. Yeah. Roberta says they wanted to prevent his body from decaying. Mm. Somebody said something right above her. They that was irrelevant to the... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. It went up so fast I didn't hear. I didn't see it. Yeah. So, um... Yeah, it would have been extremely costly, I'm sure. And they wanted to make sure that that body was properly, properly cared for, which is just such an example of their love. Something that occurred to me as you're continuing to comment here is, I don't know how to say that, I, I don't want this to sound disrespectful, but what a gross job this would be. I mean, you think about there's a dead body and you think about what happened to that dead body before it died. I mean, Jesus was just so brutally, brutally, brutally murdered in so many ways. We won't go back through that again. Um, but man, they're gonna, they're gonna undo all the, you know, the strips and they're gonna put more spices on him. And if they haven't done a good job, now they don't know this, that it's all in the providence of God that he will not be decayed. In fact, he won't even be there. <laughs> but if you don't know that, then you've got to be hoping that we don't have a maggot situation going on and insects and, you know, other things that, and, and the stench and the smell that would happen with a decaying body. So the fact that these women went to do this, um, Deb says, showing their dedication and their love. And was that Karen that said they're out of their respect? I, I missed the name of that person that said that. Um, yeah, Karen says to keep Jesus' body from decaying. Louise said they honored and loved him so much they wanted to give him a proper burial. Yes. Judy said the compassion of women. And Susie said mm -hmm. to honor Jesus. Yeah. Terry says, I'm not sure, but I think the love and respect for the Lord and wanted to care for him. And Deb says just showing their dedication and love. I love that. And I think all of that is true. And by the way, do you notice who's not doing this? I don't mean to rag on people, but <laughs> um, where are the disciples? Where are the 11? Where are those 11 guys that Jesus spent three whole years with and poured his entire life into? And additionally, who kind of owe him right now in a way? They all left. Yeah. Like, they should have been there. You would think that they'd be like, oh, we, we failed, but you know what? Let's take care of it now. You know where they are? They're hiding. They're locked up in a little room, freaking out. They're hiding in a room. They're scared. They have not yet come through this on the other side. They are freaked out. They didn't watch what happened, so they've heard what happened. I'm sure it's been told to them by the women and others who were around, but they didn't even stay for the crucifixion. They, they weren't witnesses to it. 
So yeah, Emily says, were they scared for their own lives? I, I think absolutely they sure were. Margie says they were behind closed doors. They didn't, they didn't go to the tomb. Now let me ask you another question. Are any of these people expecting Jesus to rise from the dead? And Susie says, yeah, what happened to the disciples? M-I-A. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, were any of these people, the women, the disciples, any of them have any, like, even the slightest thought that maybe when we go, he won't be there? Tammy says, no. It certainly doesn't appear that way, does it? It absolutely does not. In fact, scripture is very clear. Um, Nobody expected, not, not of Jesus' followers, not a single one of them, not any of the disciples, not any of the women, none of them thought this was going to happen. And I love that the angels even called them out on that, and they were like, he told you this was going to happen, and then quote his words back to them, where he tells them that he's going to be killed and then rise from the dead, which is just... Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and we're going to talk more about this later and why that was, because this is really, really interesting stuff. Noelle, could you just read verses 2 to 4 again? So like I said, Absolutely. we're going to go back and kind of break it down a little bit. Certainly. Verse 2 of chapter 24, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. Okay, so... Luke says the stone was rolled away, but what's really, really interesting is that in Mark's gospel and John's gospel, they don't use the Greek word for rolled. Luke does. In fact, I think Matthew does too. But Mark and John use a completely different word here. And the word is more of, um, it's like describing a, something as if it has been picked up and carried to a different location which is not incongruent, by the way, like, oh no, you know, Luke's had rolled and they're like picked up and put somewhere. Not incongruent at all. None of them saw this. So Luke, he's not taking a whole lot of time to describe it, maybe because his gospel was written later and he knew that John and Mark had already described it in more detail, which we don't pick up in the English, by the way. You'd have to um, either read Greek or like me, read people who read Greek <laughs> that can tell you these things. But I, I'm so excited to hear this because if you remember, we talked yesterday about how massive that stone was that was rolled in front of the entrance to the tomb, that it would have been maybe up to two tons, would have probably taken maybe 20 men to move it. And not only was it huge, massive, and thick, but it had been rolled down um, an incline and then into a rut that had been dug out. So, and it set down in, which means getting it out of that rut is going to be really hard. You're going to work against gravity like crazy. We don't know how that rock moved. Did Jesus move it? Did the angels move it? Did God move it? Did he just speak it and it just moved on its own? Did he blow on it and it just fell over there? We don't know because we're not told. But what I can tell you based on Mark and John's gospel is that it's not what we have all seen paintings of and maybe you've pictured in your mind if you've ever thought about this, like like there's the entrance to the tomb, y'all will see that, and then right next to it is that rock. Like it went, and they just rolled it a little bit. Mm -mm. It was somewhere way over there. <laughs> so in Luke's estimation, I mean, you could have rolled it over there or in John and Mark's estimation, it looks like somebody actually carried it and dumped it over there. I don't think it was probably even standing up by this point, it probably, like that. Oh, Dottie asked a wonderful question. How did the women think they could move it? They had no idea. In fact, they talk about this on the way and how they're going to accomplish this. They don't know. One of the other gospels, I don't remember which one. Yeah. And Emily says, I'm so curious about the glowing clothes. We know from the other accounts that these men, young men, in glowing clothes are angels. And um, I think it's in John that it tells us that they're actually in the tomb. Uh, at one point, one of the writers says one is sitting where Jesus' head was, one is sitting where his feet was. So, and, and they're moving around because you get like different locations based on the gospel. One says they're standing, one says they're sitting. Again, not incongruent. And by the way, when you hear stuff like this, I just have to say this, a lot of people feel like, 
one um, gospel writer wrote a gospel and then the other gospel writers took his manuscript and basically they copied and, and they changed a couple words here and there. That is not what happened. If it were, we wouldn't have so many different perspectives on situations. We wouldn't have Luke completely leaving out things that maybe Matthew puts in. It's not contrived. It's not copied. They're not trying to say, oh, how are we going to do this so everybody thinks it's the same thing. You can tell they're writing from their hearts in the power of the Holy Spirit who is in, you know, inspiring them to do this. But yeah, angels show up for this event. And this is just unbelievable. One other little point. Jesus did not need the stone rolled away to get out. He needed the stone rolled away so that the other people could come in. So he wasn't in <laughs> It's there. a wonderful comment. Yes, he was. Because he is now in his glorified, resurrected body. And we're going to talk more about this in a few minutes. He can walk through walls if he wants to. He could have walked right through the wall of that cave. He could have disappeared and reappeared. He is no longer bound by all of the confines of being human. And yet... He still will exist in a very human, but perfect, glorified body. So it's amazing. So the angels scare the women out of their minds. Wonder yeah, why. Obviously. <laughs> they were not expecting this. Well, have you ever just been somewhere and somebody just kind of like surprised you all of a sudden there's a person next to you? You're like, oh, oh. where did you come from, right? Yeah. Well, if you're in a freaky tomb <laughs> and... All of a sudden, there's two guys standing next to you, and they're glowing. You're like, oh, I don't think so. First, you notice that the dead person's gone. Oh, we're told in another gospel, the grave clothes are there. That's really important. Because oh, when, when grave robbers robbed graves, they would they you know take a corpse that they hoped maybe was like bejeweled or something. They could unwrap them and take the jewels and dump the body. They didn't bother to carefully unwrap them in the grave. They'd take the body and run, and then they would unwrap and then dump. Yeah, it says here that Peter wrote, ran over. He saw the strips of linen lying by themselves and was confused. <laughs> <laughs> like, what sort of grave robber does something like that? He's amazed. He doesn't know what to think about it. And I'm sure the women were in the same spot. I mean, you, you can almost just put yourself in their place. They have no expectation here of a resurrection. They should, but they don't. And they get there, and there's all the grave clothes. But there's no Strange. body. And then suddenly you turn around, and there's two angels that are shining, bright, glory sort of guys. And it says that they they literally went down, like, on their face. They just, yeah. I don't think they were worshiping because they weren't. Uh, if, if you worship an angel in the Bible, you, you get scolded. At, they say, stop it. A couple of times they'll say, stop, don't do that. Don't worship me. Only I think they're just God. freaked out. I think like, they just fall what down. What do you do? Yeah, they, and they're hiding their faces moment. because it's just so unbelievable. Um and so they give them a, just a kind of a mild scolding here coming up. So let's read verses 5 to 7. Did we do those yet? Yeah. We haven't. Verse 5, In their fright the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Ah, oh, this is so great. Now, I don't know about you, but at this point, I have a major question going on in my mind, which is, what happened to the guards? We, we had guards, <laughs> and now we don't have guards. What happened to the guards? Are you interested in what happened to the guards? Because if I'm you curious. are, Matthew fills us in on the situation. It's a situation, let me tell you what. Matthew 27, 62 to 66. If you want to turn there, you can. If you want to just listen, you can. Matthew 27, 62 to 66. Let me read what happened. The next day, that is the day of preparation, after the day of preparation. So we're now we're on the Sabbath, okay? This is the day of preparation, is preparation for the Sabbath. It's the next day, it's the Sabbath, Saturday. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate and said, Sir, oh my word, they're suddenly so respectful. How nice. Sir, 
we remember how that imposter, they will not say his name. You'll never hear them say the name of Jesus. They will not say it. Not even in the book of Acts will they say it. Um, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. Again, Pilate's like, just please get out. Please make this end. Whatever you need to do, just stop. I just want to be done. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Okay, I have so many questions. You probably do too. <laughs> First question. Um, how come the religious leaders totally knew that Jesus had claimed he would rise from the dead on the third day, but none of Jesus's followers so understood it. So odd. How, okay, how is that possible? So the religious leaders actually say to Pilate, he claimed he was gonna rise again. They're nervous about an actual resurrection. They're like, how can we make this stop? And if there's not one, what if the disciples Fake it. Try to make sure that everyone thinks that there was because he said he would do that. These evil, satanic, wicked people got it. And Jesus' beloved followers, the women, the disciples, none of them got it. It's very quiet out there. <laughs> it's a hard question. That's a understand. really, I know. This is why it takes me so long to prepare because I'm like, oh. I don't know what to say to that. What is the answer? I have to How is it, it possible? <laughs> uh, Margie says, that is funny. Yeah, it's really weird, isn't it? Because you would expect the exact opposite. Like if you were writing the Bible or I was writing the Bible, I would have it so that the religious leaders had no idea he was going to rise again. And all the disciples and all the women and all his yeah. followers, they knew it. They were waiting for it. I mean, that's how it would go if I were writing it. God does the absolute opposite here, which he so often does. And you know, his purposes and his ways are so far beyond our ways. Roberta says they are still thinking he was going to overcome Rome. So you're speaking of the disciples and the followers of Jesus. And I think I, you make yeah. a really excellent point, Roberta. Their minds have no place for a crucified Messiah. And they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. So A plus B equals C. Jesus is the Messiah, plus Messiah will overtake Rome, equals Messiah cannot die on a cross. Emily says the Jews were still afraid and probably believed he was the Messiah. I think, again, really, really good point. The religious leaders, they rejected him, but they were nervous, very nervous that he was. Um, they're going by quickly, so you're going to have to pick it up on your computer. Yeah, Lori said Jesus did perform miracles. Mm -hmm. Susie says, did the guards see or hear Jesus arise, then run away because of total fear? Emily mm -hmm. said his followers could have been in such shock and horror, they weren't thinking straight yet. Uh, that's a really good point, too. I think we underestimate the shock and horror because we know what happened. But <laughs> on, right. on the other side of it, when you don't have 20-20 hindsight, it's got to look just insane like what just happened how did this just happen so i think that's a really great point here's what's so incredibly interesting and again just helps us understand this is not a book written by just regular old people who are just trying to make up a good story and tell you fairy tales that this book yes written by men but inspired by god himself without error totally true and right because only god thinks like this we're told in Luke 9.45, now I'm going to, two references that we've already covered in the past, but I'm going to read them to you again. Luke 9.45, he had been speaking of his crucifixion and suffering, and it says, but they did not understand the saying, his disciples, and this is key, it was concealed from them so that they might not perceive it, and they were afraid to ask him about the saying. It was concealed from them so that they could not perceive it. My question to you is, who concealed it? 
Who, because this is key information, you have to get this or nothing makes any sense. Who did the concealing? So that when Jesus actually spoke very directly, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to rise again, he said it over and over, we're told here that information was concealed from these disciples. Who and why? Who concealed it? And while you're thinking, let me read the next one to you because it's a parallel-ish thought. It's not a parallel passage, but a parallel thought. Luke 18, 30. But they understood none of these things, once again, speaking of the crucifixion and suffering. And again, this saying was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Roberta and Judy and Tammy and Susie are all saying, it was God. It was God. It was God. It was Jesus. It was God the Father. Yeah. But why? Why would God do something like that? We got step one. You're right. It was concealed by God himself. He somehow, like blind, not, not physical, but um, spiritual, blind so that even when he spoke clearly, they didn't get it. They couldn't get it. Why did he do that? I'm really interested to hear what you have to say because this is so incredibly important and it goes back to our point of how come the religious leaders got it? Right. And the disciples didn't. We said, well, we, now we know how that happened. The, the followers of Jesus, it was concealed. God actually made it so they could not understand. They would not understand it. He blinded them from that. Now the question is, why did he do that? Obviously, major purpose here, because this is strange. You typically don't think of God as blinding you. You think of him as enlightening you. Good God, he says, I give up. But Susie says, <laughs> to have a greater impact on them when Jesus died and rose again. Margie says, but later they remembered and recorded his prophetic words. Terry said to be a powerful witness. Mm. Excellent thoughts. Deb and, said faith. And faith. All right. To develop faith. All right. When the religious leaders are worried about the disciples coming and stealing the body, it was outrageous that they would be worried about that. Here's why. Because the disciples were utterly freaked out because they did not know what was coming. And they all fled. And that fulfilled prophecy, right? Remember? Like everything that was going on was just fulfilling prophecy left and right. Um, also, I'm just trying to get like how to, how to put this into words. There are people today who scoff at the resurrection and they'll, they'll say things like, um, well, Jesus never really rose again anyway. And they'll say, you know, his, his disciples came and they stole his body, um, you know, or it's their, his friends came along and rolled the stone away and they took the body and they hid it and then they claimed it was a resurrection. One of the greatest um, points in the actual resurrection being true is that none of Jesus' followers None of them expected him to rise again. Had they expected it, all this information would have been completely different. Yeah. And people would have had a right to say, we don't know. I mean, they all wanted a resurrection really, 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 really bad. What were they willing to risk to get it? Maybe they stole his body because they were just dying for that to happen. They just had to have him rise again. We can look at scripture and we can go, absolutely not. It wasn't even on their radar. They had no idea it was going to happen. Even after it happened, they couldn't figure out what had happened. <laughs> it wasn't like they saw the empty tomb and went, oh my word, he said he was going to do this. He did it. Angels have to come and tell them. <laughs> and then when the women go tell the disciples, <clears throat> they're like, <clears throat> excuse me, total nonsense. They, they don't, don't even you. believe it. So, uh, yeah, some of you said that God did it to protect them. And he did it, yeah, both to protect the disciples and to also protect the validity of the word of God as it went out. Absolutely. Um, 
I like how she says they couldn't be held accountable for stealing his body because they didn't know or comprehend that he would rise again. Yeah. Exactly. It's why it's so outrageous to think that somebody just came and took it. All the people who would have wanted to were terrified. Like all the men, <laughs> they're hiding. And, and the women are hardly capable of doing something like that. And they, they, they brought spices. They didn't come to steal the body. They came to embalm it. Uh, it's just, there's no other explanation for the empty tomb. And if somebody took the body, it's easy to um, figure this out. Go, go find it. Go get the body. And it's over at that moment. They never, ever, ever found him because he was not there. Dead. He was alive. Here's something else very interesting on another train of thought here. This is the Sabbath. Um, we have religious leaders going to Pilate and asking for some very specific things on this Sabbath. And it just kind of irked me because these are the people who won't let anybody work. They won't let anybody ask anyone else to work. Even to this day, if you visit Israel and you're there on a Sabbath, you cannot do something to help a person who is religiously observing the Sabbath and to this day will not work. And they have very strict rules. If you're not familiar with them, kind of almost think of like Amish um, people, like electricity, no electricity, you know, the, those for one day. Um, I remember being in an elevator on the Sabbath and a guy asked me what floor I was going to. And it was just like this huge hotel. I don't remember how many floors, like 30, 40 floors. It was huge. And I, I told him and, and he said, oh, okay. And I, and I was like, oh my word, he can't press the button because it's electrical and he's not allowed because it's a Sabbath. I, and I felt terrible for him. I said, hey, you just tell me what floor you want. I, I said, I, I'm free. I will press the button for you. I just tell me the floor. He said, oh, no, no, no. Like I freaked him out. No, 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 no. It's, it's okay. So he got off at my floor and then I saw him go through the stairwell and he walked down any number of, I don't know, he, he just judged, you know, how, like, do I want to get off with her? Do I want to get off with that other person? How far do I have to go? That's still how they think of it. And all that to say, he wouldn't let me press the elevator button because he is forbidden to ask me to work, even as a Gentile where I don't mind. I'll press the button all day long, not a problem. He is forbidden to ask me to do it. Back to the text here. Um, they are not only violating their Sabbath and that I have no doubt that they are walking way further than whatever tiny, remember they could go like as far as to like to water their mule, if, as long as the mule didn't go too far. It was a very short distance. These guys are, they're all over the place. So they violated that rule. Um, they're talking to a Gentile. I think they violated that rule. Then they're asking for soldiers to go work by guarding, violated it again. And again, these are not God's rules. These are their rules. <laughs> They're violating. But these are the rules that they were so hung up on when Jesus was yes. daring to heal somebody on a Sabbath. Yes. Now they can't really... touch a tomb. They can't get near a tomb. It's the Sabbath. They'll be defined. They don't mind. They're, they're all good. We got to seal this thing up. So they break at least four of their own rules, probably even more than that if we really stop to think about it. <laughs> I actually wrote in my notes, but what if they break any rules they want? Morons. <laughs> That's what her notes look like. They're great. <laughs> I called them morons in my notes because I got mad. So I'm not a very good Bible teacher. <laughs> people morons in my notes anyway it just made me mad because they saddle these people with these rules they sat they try to saddle Jesus and then they end up killing him because he doesn't keep their rules and then they just go break them all oh here's the other thing where do they get all the money for all this stuff I mean, they got to pay for it huh. yeah okay so Margie's saying um they sealed it what does that mean? What yeah, that, what does it mean to seal yeah, like, a tomb? You think almost like, like that flex seal stuff that like you spray around and it forms <laughs> this barrier, you know, and water can't get in or something. It's not that. It's not flex that at seal, all. Strong enough to keep the Messiah in. <laughs> yeah. Kidding. It's it not. wasn't. <laughs> no, nope, he broke out of that. Um, so the sealing of a tomb, first of all, could only be done in the presence of a Roman guard. 
it was in their presence to observe and or do the entire thing. So they had to be there. So the guards would go in and inspect the tomb. Yep, bodies in there, check. Then they would come out, then they would take that gigantic stone that we're talking about, they would roll it down the incline, into the rut, and now it's not going anywhere. But if they needed to seal it, they would take a cord and they would stretch it across that rock and on either side, and I couldn't figure out how they did this. Uh, nobody seems to talk about it or know maybe, but somehow they fastened that cord with like um, soft clay that would dry really hard uh, to the tomb itself. So the, the rope would go, it's kind of like caution tape, like across the, the big stone. Then they would take this clay, they would somehow attach that cord into or onto that clay. And then they would take the Imperial Roman seal, which usually was in the form of a signet ring, very, very special, the imprint, you wouldn't be able to forge it. And they would stamp that into the seal on both sides. So that if you opened it, you would break one or both seals. And the penalty for seal breaking in the Roman Empire was usually death, if not maybe a very, very severe flogging and beating. So it wasn't something that you were just like, yeah, I think I'll pull that caution tape down. It's time to play on the playground. Not at all. They wouldn't just go breaking seals. And again, the disciples who are currently MIA hiding because they're freaking out and they're terrified, they're not going to go break a seal. They don't want to die right now. And that would be sure death for them. So they're not getting that body out. Again, this is all in the plan of to verify the true resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because they had Roman guards inspect that tomb and check it out, see that it truly was exactly. Jesus in there. There can be no question of, well, maybe Jesus wasn't in there to begin with. Maybe he was never in there. No, the Roman guards inspected it. They sealed the thing up with their signet ring saying it. That's right. Or that they had the wrong tomb. Right. It, they, had, they had been there. I mean, these are guards, they, this is their realm, this is what they do. We're not that far from the crucifixion. They knew exactly what was going on. They had probably watched the entire thing. They were hired to stand guard, not fall asleep, and make sure nobody crosses that line. And nobody, nobody in or out. <laughs> That's right. Now I want to read Matthew 28, 11 to 15. Maybe you want to write that down for them. Matthew 28, 11 through 15. Did you already do it? Well, the thing is that if I keep having my thing up, I think it's causing internet problems. So just say it one more oh, time, they'll get it. Okay, Matthew 28, 11 to 15. Sorry about that. It um, says this, While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest what had taken place. Now this is after, by the way. Sorry, I should have uh, prefaced this. This is after the whole thing comes apart. So uh, Jesus is out. Let me back up this. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priest what had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell the people his disciples came at night and stole him away while we were asleep. They're paying him, they're paying them a bribe. The, the religious leaders say, um, oh boy, you're selling us he's gone, huh? Because, we're, I, I'm just trying to move along here, what I didn't read to you is that there's an earthquake, angels show up, and the guards, it says they faint as though they were dead. <laughs> so they drop over completely scared of the earthquake and the angels. And when they come to, earthquake's done, angels are gone, the stone is somewhere else. They look in and there's just grave clothes. And these guys know all oh, nuts we're in trouble we lost the body so oh and they tell the elders um this is what happened guys uh -oh. what's really interesting is that the elders do not say are you kidding us we're gonna have you executed you didn't guard the body they don't say that no isn't that interesting what they do say is in verse 13 of Matthew 28, tell, tell people, um, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were 
And if this, they're saying to this, these guards, oh, and if this comes to the governor's ears, that's Pilate, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. Don't you, don't you worry, we got you, we got you. We're gonna pay him off too. So they took the money. Where did that money come from? The temple. <laughs> they keep God's robbing money, robbing the temple funds that people are giving to God, and they're using it to bribe and pay people off for this type of thing. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. This is Matthew speaking of his of his day. So at the time he's writing this, he's going. This is still the story that people are spreading around. Yeah. It's a false rumor. It's a problem. It's a I am sorry. This, it looks like a lot of you are saying that we're freezing. So um, you can go back and watch it later. You might have to do that. I am so sorry. I wonder if I should just wrap it up. Since How we're about you wrap it up? Since we're having internet problems tonight. This is a good place to stop. It's 45 minutes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> wrap it up. <laughs> um, okay. So do you want to pray with them tonight? Or do we just wrap it up without praying tonight? Because... Just wrap it up. Okay. I'm going to let you go. I apologize for the internet problems, but if we're having internet problems, then um, I think there's no point in us continuing. So <laughs> we will continue this tomorrow night, though, without internet problems and continue walking you through this so that you can get the most out of it. Um, but this is really exciting stuff because these are, this is the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we don't want you to miss any of this. So we're going to let you go for the night. Thank you for being here. We love you guys. Go make good decisions.